Hey, everybody, welcome to my first attempt at doing a Patreon podcast, okay? So I'm not sure how this is going to work out. I'm recording this, and then I'm going to edit it, and then I'm hopefully going to be able to put this up and see how long it's able to do this. So, well, let's start with the first thing. Why am I doing this? I decided to do this podcast because my wife is always saying that she would rather be able to hear things while she's doing stuff, so I want to be able to get this done and make her happy. So... I decided to create this new series. This new series is going to be called uh, On the Path of Capoeira or On the Path, right? Literally 10 years ago, in 2013, I released my first book, The Path of Capoeira. And if you haven't read that, I recommend you read it. If you're here on Patreon, I'm going to make sure that I upload the PDF file both in English and in Japanese so you guys have access to that feel free to email me if you have any questions or if you have any insights that you'd like to add to this uh, podcast, to this, to my, to my speaking about capoeira and life as a capoeira mestri. So as I mentioned, 10 years ago, I wrote my book. Since then, I guess the most important thing that has happened internally, I realized that writing the book was probably the best way that I could emotionally and psychologically grow because it gave me an incredible chance to reflect on how I had developed up to that point in 2013 as a capoeira mestre. So now, 10 years later, I feel it's a good time to reflect on that, especially post-pandemic, and see how I've grown. Different experiences have added to my personality and to my way of doing things, and overall how I want to conduct myself in a morally good character fashion, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, pretty much, you know, shoot from the hip and talk about some topics, and this will become a series called On the Path. So welcome to On the Path. So like I said, 10 years ago, I wrote the book. Now, I was looking at the book and the first picture that came up and I realized it had the biggest impact on me as a master of Capoeira and also as a human being was that when I wrote the book, I was very, very close to a a person on the first picture, uh, Contra Mestre Kalani. And due to different things that had happened and choices in life, I, I had to cut that relationship. And I realized that it was, it wasn't the only relationship that I had cut in Capoeira, but also in my life. And I realized it's because I was going through a a process of getting rid of all the toxic people in my life. So right now, as I sit in front of you, I, I can say, you know, honestly, I have no toxic relationships in my life. I don't know if that's a result of me being older, maybe stronger emotionally, mentally in the last 10 years, but I did see myself consciously choosing and choosing to disconnect a lot of relationships and people and take them out of my life who I felt were toxic. Of course, I'm not saying I'm perfect. Of course, I'm not saying that everything I do is is amazing. But what I do do is I do have a conscious, uh, how can I say, I do have a conscious idea of what I'm doing if that makes any sense. Like, I know when I wake up in the morning, I think, okay, how can I make a better person? How how can I make a better mess? How can I be? And every night when I go to sleep, I think to myself, I think, hey, how can I, you know, be a better master? How can I improve? How can I be a better father? How can I be a better husband? How can I be a better friend? And these things, honestly, I think about all the time. I think a lot of it has to do more with the strong cultural anthropological background that I have. And that really influences me a lot in what I do. I hope the speed of me talking isn't too bad, but, you know, we'll see. If, if someone thinks I'm speaking too fast, you guys can tell me, and I'll try to slow down a little bit. So getting rid of all the toxic people in my life was actually a, a long process. It wasn't a process from one day to another. And I think it's because we all have these uh, human connections, and we feel good guilt, we feel tired, we feel um, longing, we, we miss those relationships. 
But at the end of the day, we really need to think, how are those relationships affecting me or how they affect you and, and how they affect you and the result of how they affect the people around you? In my case, those toxic relationships were trying to pull me in to being something that would be really easy for me to be. In many situations, the relationships try to bring me back to regress into a very, how can I say, in a very ghetto way of behaving, something that I was raised from, right? I remember growing up in in San Diego, South San Diego, and one of my my greatest fun, I guess my my most fun experiences was uh, we grew up right on the border, and it was amazing. There was uh, I want to say San Isidro Dairy Farms, Dairy Road was like a big a big road, and it was literally like a stone's throw from the uh, Mexican U.S. border. At the time, it was just a fence, right? We're talking in um, probably the nineteen seventies, early eighties, and my my mother's friend had a house that was literally like I don't want to say I can't I can't even say I mean it was in a really undeveloped area of the border more towards like uh, right behind the the dairy farm actually we would go down to the dairy farm and look at the cows and all that stuff and the house was you know it's hard to remember but I would say it wasn't it wasn't a hundred yards from the Mexican border so. At night, you would see those those images. I don't know if you ever watched Born in East LA, but the waves of humans just coming, you know, from across the border. And I mean, I grew up with that. At the same time, there were giant holes under the fence. It was just one of those regular wire fences. There was nothing like that was gonna. Keep, it wasn't gonna keep anybody out. And growing up, uh, really, really low income or below the poverty line in the United States. The one dollar that I could get my hands on for doing whatever, you know, when I when I had a little bit of money, my friend and I, when I was staying at his mom's house, which is my mom's friend's house, we would go under the fence and we would go into Mexico. It was just a highway. That was the scariest thing, right? We were like, I don't know, nine, ten. And we would go under the fence and cross the street. And I could still visualize it. And there was a little candy store or like little convenience store, right? And it was just such a magical experience. I remember buying um, fireworks and bringing them back into San Diego. That was crazy. And we would shoot them over the, the cows. It was one of those Roman candles. Like it was a stick. And when you light it, fireballs would like shoot out. And I mean, when you're like 10 years old, that's like, I mean, it's magic and it's wild. And, you know, it's, it's dangerous now that I think about it. But, you know, I was 10. I didn't know what I was doing. Today, I realized that I could have gone a very different route. By the time I was in junior high and high school, I knew people who were uh, smuggling or bringing across um, illegal drugs and different things. I mean, no one straight out said it. A couple of people had asked me if I'd be interested in doing it. And I realized, you know, that that was going to be the wrong way to go. So I never went that route. And I'm very lucky because uh, growing up, it was weird. You would see it at certain, pl- you know, friends' houses and whatnot. You'd see like drugs and stuff. But kind of ambivalent to it. I never really paid attention to see like a brick of weed or some, you know, at the time we didn't really see, I was too young, so I don't really know what was going on or really aware of what it was, but like you knew it was weed. That's about that. By the age of 12, I knew what that was, but like it was never me doing it or anyone around me doing it in my face. People did it, but I was never in the position to do it. So and I could have gone into that route, but because at the time, I just remember the famous NWA uh, Dope Man lyric, right? You must understand, never get high on your own supply. So I always thought of like when people were doing those kind of drug things, a lot of it was to make money. So I was never really attracted to the whole drug thing, but that's a completely different story. The The point is, is that I could have taken a different route. I could have taken a route that led, for example, there was this guy uh, when I was uh, going to junior college and I was working at, I can't remember the name of the shop. It was like Sun, not Sunglass Hut, because that's a big one. Sun, like, I can't remember, but it was in a Chula Vista Mall. And I was working at a sunglass shop 
And one of my high school friends, right? Who, well, not a friend, somebody I knew who he was always cool to me. And in high school, he was like, I mean, he was like decked out, right? He had the guest clothes. He had the gold chains. I mean, he looked like a new Jack Hustler, right? And he had a 5.0 Mustang, and I also heard he had a Porsche. And I mean, I just knew that it was coming from doing something illicit, that he was doing from drug dealing. And I guess this is one of the main points and the main reasons why I never decided, like, I'm going to go down the path of doing something criminal. And I'm talking about this now because at the time, it was so within my reach, if I think about it. And how I dodged so many bullets not going that route. And later, I, I'll tell you guys about why I quit high school and all the stuff that was going on. Because this podcast, or this uh, talking is also going to be a way for me to help better explain to you all the situations that added to my life, good and bad. But I'm a person who really, really believes that I wouldn't change anything because it I am here with my, my amazing family, my friends, and my Capoeira Academy because of the choices that I've made. Okay, So back to this uh, story. I don't want to say the guy's name because it, it might hurt somebody. I don't know. One of my friends might hear this pod, podcast and think, hey, look, that was insane. So at the time, uh, my, my really, really, really good friend, Ronnie, he knows this story because he, he had picked me up to go out that weekend. But um, so the guy shows up and he was with his friend who was kind of like his right hand in, in, in criminal activity. And they showed up to the sunglass hut. And at the time, the gazelles, the ones that MC Hammer was wearing. I mean, you remember those, the big ones with the, with the gold frames? And it's just like, look, look at me, look at me. And uh, he had bought like two pairs of gazelles. They were $400 uh, each just to put it. In perspective, my rent was about $150 at the time as I was renting out a room in San Diego, sharing a house. So $400 was a lot. I mean, it's almost three months of my rent. And he bought two of those. The Oakleys had just come out. A lot of people don't know Oakleys also from San Diego. And a couple other things. He had his little entourage, right? And he just pulls out this wad of cash and, and he looks at me and he gives me that look. And he says, hey, you know, it's been, I haven't seen you in a while. How's it going? Oh, I'm going to junior college. He goes, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. And um, he was always really cool to me. About two months later, I see his partner, the guy who had come in with him, who was kind of always a jerk in junior high and high school. I mean, he, he was kind of thuggish to begin with, but uh, he, he's like, walking through the mall and he looks really freaked out, like, like, like looking everywhere, paranoid. And um, later I had mentioned that to, to my friend and he had said, oh, you didn't hear? And I said, no, I didn't hear. And he goes, uh, he's running from the Mexican mafia, right? And I was like, wow, this is insane. What's going on here? And it turns out that the guy that was cool to me, the guy who kind of led the little, the crew, was, uh, had stolen from the Mexican mafia, you know, doing something with the drugs, I guess, taking a little off the top and they had taken him and they had cut off his hands and his head and they had shipped his head package to his mom. And I want to say right here, the reason I'm saying this is because this is kind of like the stuff that was around me growing up. And a lot of times people will ask me, well, why, why do you think so, so ghetto or why do you have that, that background? And this will lead to the, to the point that I want to make today. But um, I was like, wow, because at the time I was struggling and I could have asked, hey, do you need any help? I mean, it was so easy. I knew several people who were doing things that you could just, you know, find something to do illegal and you could have done it. But after that story, I was kind of like, wow. Now I'm going to say this as a discreditor. I don't know if the story is true. I do know that he disappeared. I do know it wasn't on the news or I didn't see anything on the news about it. But like most stories, something happened and I never heard from him again. No one ever heard from him again. Several people had collaborated the story. But again, the ghetto, uh, the, bar the barrio, grapevine, 
los chismosos, la gente que dice lo que le da la gana. You know, you never know what's going on. So people just say. And 10 years ago when I finished this book, I reflected, and that was one of the main stories that had hit me. And I thought to myself, wow, I could have really taken a different path. But even though I didn't take that path, I maintained relationships with people who had taken that path. For example, people who were doing things that were going to catch up with them. In Portuguese, uh, my papai, I call papai, when I refer to him, means uh, Messi Daimion, one of the greatest uh, samba players to come out of Rio de Janeiro. He lives in Japan. My papai used to say, you know, quien se acha mais malandro vai se acabando. Who thinks that they're more street smart, more cunning, more, more, you know, more ready to go is the person who's going to end up getting caught. Because these kind of situations, you have to lie a lot, you have to use people, you have to, you have to be always thinking of taking advantage of people to get ahead. And the problem is, at a certain point, you're the one who gets left behind or people figure you out. So a lot of these toxic relationships I saw when I was in college and then later, and it really didn't hit me until being married to my, to my lovely wife that I realized I have to cut these relationships because the toxicity of these relationships affected me, which in turn created ripple effects that affected my kids, my wife, my friends, because it was easy to get that energy for me. In a way, it was like, you know, it would be so easy to get pulled back into that bad behavior that I realized I had to get out because it was hurting the people who really loved me. So the point that I really want to end this with today as this is just a sample, right? Because I'm going to be doing more and more in-depth talks like this on Patreon. This is for the people who really see, you know, the value in what I'm doing. And <clears throat> since it is a little personal, I feel, you know, maybe people will, will be able to learn, right? Because everyone makes mistakes in life, but it's how we, how we, how we evolve, how we progress after that. And the main point today is that, you, you know, if you have toxic people in your life, you've got to get rid of those relationships. And people say, well, it's a brother, it's a sister, it's a mom, it's a dad. In my life, the most toxic person I've ever met, close personal friends and all, was my mother. Trust me, there's going to be a lot of references to her. <laughs> and again, it's because I've come full circle and I've come to except what I could control, what I couldn't control. But the one thing that I can control today is who I associate with and who, who I am, right, and how I act. And this most importantly comes from capoeira. In capoeira, we have, we have this system of, you know, you feel like you're obligated. So many people say, oh, I feel obligated to, to go to this event. I feel obligated to, let, to invite these people to come to my event. And then later, it's just complaining about how bad the event was or how bad the people were, especially in Capoeira. Because remember, in Capoeira, we're generally dealing with um, people who aren't from a first world country. It doesn't mean Brazil is bad. I love Brazil. I love Brazilian people. I'm doing it all. And I'm hoping that through this, people can, can, can understand that today, you know, as a master of capoeira, I live through Brazilian culture and I live through capoeira culture. I would say more capoeira culture than Brazilian culture. And why? And I'll, I'll talk about that later in another uh, podcast. But cutting in, in, in capoeira, there's so many people. Like I have a really good friend who recently quit capoeira and we had talked about uh, how he quit because he was just tired of all the politics and the word politics in Portuguese, a little polemica, politica, everything. And um, it's really just gossip and egos and you, you feel obligated and you feel these toxic relationships, but do you really need them? Do we really need to be part of relationships that don't benefit us in any way? 
And when I mean benefit, because that's what a relationship is. It's about getting something, right? Or giving something. Now you can benefit in a positive way where you get something very, you know, good. Growth, business, uh, moral support, mentorship. Or you can go the other way and get a lot of stuff that's like really negative, you know? People trying to abuse you, making you feel guilty. Um, If you're giving and you're not getting, then get out. I mean, you got to learn it at some point in your life. Now, this month, um, I'm going to turn 52, and it took me a long time to understand a lot of this. And uh, the moral and mental development that I've gone through, which I call uh, my malicia, is the capoeira word for uh, like spiritual philosophy. And it took a while. But here I am today, cut a lot of the toxic relationships and moving forward. Okay, guys, um, let me know in the comments when I post this, what do you think about this podcast? Do you think it's a good idea? I don't know if I want to make videos. I'd rather make artistic stuff on video and commentary stuff like this because actually I felt really comfortable just speaking into the microphone. Okay, guys, thanks for supporting. We've got... uh, 12 or 14, let me check here. I can see this on my computer. We've got, uh, give me a second. This is all crazy stuff. Okay, I just went to my Patreon account. Using the computer is also a lot easier to check stuff. We've got 12 patrons, about $170 coming in a month. And you know what? Thank you. I'm going to use that, of course, to, to you know get another green screen or some more lights. And I've got some videos coming up. So bear with me and thank you for supporting, guys. Have a blessed day.